Welcome to The Teacher's Story. I'm Jackie Scully. This is a podcast to elevate teacher voice. In this program, you will hear teachers sharing their journey into this profession and their ideas for education. I'm kicking it off Teacher Appreciation Week, which starts May 2nd. This is about honest, vulnerable, inspiring storytelling. It's a time and a space for teachers to share their ideas for the future of education. Teachers are beautiful beings who give their heart and soul to their community. They're innovators, they're inspirational, not only to children, but to the people around them. And they deserve to share their voice. So welcome to the teacher's story, enjoy. Hi, welcome to the teacher's story. I'm Jackie Scully, and today we have Dr. Subra Mukherjee with us. We had a lovely conversation a couple of weeks ago, so I'm so excited to have her on. She's a former professor, and she is a current scientific research consultant. She has her PhD in electrical and electronics engineering. She's an author of two books. And one of her books, The Invisible Yoke, was recently nominated as the best life and relationship author in 2021. Uh, she's also a TEDx speaker, and her TEDx was called Break the Invisible Yoke and Embrace Uncertainty. So quite a bunch of accomplishments. I'm so excited to have you on. So thank you for being here, Doctor. It's an absolute honor to be here in this show with you. So thank you for inviting Jacqueline. Yes, thank you. So my first question for you is what was your inspiration to get into the work that you're doing? And even just with, we'll talk about your mind mapping um, later on, but the work that you've been doing with students with mind mapping or just working with students in general. Uh, well, I, I think I need to go some two decades or even more than that back when mm -hmm. I was in high school. And I wouldn't say that I always wanted to be a teacher, at least not until class six or seven, uh, though my mom uh, is a retired school teacher. She, so I've oh. always seen my mom uh, as a teacher, you know, that profession, how novel it is and all that was fine. But um, I remember this, uh, I was in standard eight. Yeah. And one fine day, a teacher whom I was like very scared of not exactly scared of but you know I, I had in mind okay she's my maths teacher and you know I was that obedient kind of uh, child mm -hmm. <laughs> so she walks uh, up to me and she says um, uh, you got to do this um, here are these 15 students mm -hmm. who are you know I was like a day scholar and these were 15 students who stay in hostel uh, in the school so you have you got to teach them after school mathematics and I was like uh, no <laughs> I can't do it I had this in my mind I cannot do it but I was like too obedient to say no on her face and I said okay can I do it you think and she said of course then again I was like okay but I will just sit with the students along with my friends because the students were my own batchmates mm -hmm. so I will sit with them maybe in the center and you know they will all surround around the table and I'll teach them the teacher said no that's not the way you're going to do after the class ends, we'll take you to a separate room. Those 15 of your batchmates who will be then your students, they will sit and I have to walk up to that raised platform <laughs> and you know, teach and write on the blackboard. And I was like, I don't know that nervousness because I remember mm. before that I had never done any kind of, you know, speech or maybe one or once or twice, but I was too nervous to even speak to a large group of people in that way so 15 was too big a number for me but then I did you know the teacher she said I know you can do it mm. you just give your best you give your best and rest will follow mm. and I started teaching or rather sharing whatever I knew in mathematics at that point of time whatever I learned from my teacher of course the same thing I was uh, repeating it was more kind of tutoring to my own batchmates and it went on for some 30 to 40 days. Mm. And mm. I just realized that teacher, you know what she did? She told me what was the thing that I liked most. Because until then, I didn't know that I enjoyed uh, sharing knowledge or teaching so much. I thought just, okay, studying is one thing, but sharing is different things. So I was just not good at that. The confidence, the trust that she put in me gave me so much of confidence that now I could just... I remember just after that, I participated in some competitions and I started speaking more often to people, to groups and just standing up on the stage and all, whether I fumbled or not, was not there in the mind, but I would just go there. 
so that one incident i would say and thanks to the teacher who told me or who knew me better than myself mm. so that kind of inspired me i would say that is one story that, something that uh inspired that yes i can also teach and from there i think it more went like a kind of flow that uh, even though i did my engineering and then my masters and my phd all in engineering branch and i in fact got a couple of jobs in companies some very good companies but somehow that you know i want to <laughs> teach <laughs> so that thing was there so i applied for a few colleges at that time when i graduated and uh the interviewers though there were so many people who were like qualified they said no you have this curiosity to learn and teach so with that they took me it was mm-hmm. a university they took me and then it just happened <laughs> so I, i think yeah a teacher inspired me to become a teacher <laughs> yeah i love that and i often hear many stories like this i had a teacher like that when i was in 6th grade my english teacher and i've talked about that on a former episode sometimes it just takes one that there's something i feel like teachers have as a gift and they can see something in someone and they want to bring it out of their student and they want to encourage them to really take risks you know and like try to do something that might be uncomfortable like first teaching to like your other classmates but when a teacher sees something in a student and they can pull something out of them it is so powerful and i i talk about this before too like the ripple effect like a teacher inspired you and then even though you went on to do all of these wonderful you know accomplishments in like your phd and you know electrical engineering and everything and that's still a big part of you and your life you keep going back to how do i inspire people how do i spread knowledge and so kind of going into the, my next part is what were some of your early experiences with teaching as a professor you could also talk about your mind mapping and how you came up with that cuz i'm so into it we had such a great conversation the last time we met about all of the work you're doing with mind mapping oh yes i think here there are two parts to this question and i would love to answer the first part about my first experience as a teacher when i started doing it professionally earlier um, uh during my 8th standard and then even uh, after i completed my 10th standard i started teaching one year junior batches and i started earning some pocket money out of that so it was all happening but it was more like informal but after my engineering when i actually started teaching uh you know in a engineering college i still remember the first day i was more nervous than the students <laughs> and uh, when i walked into the classroom i was like oh these are all big girls and boys you know Uh, they were all above 18 years i'm standing in front of them and as a new teacher i, I had so many doubts so many questions mm-hmm. though my school teachers and everyone to- told me that you know i was very good at this but this was something new because these were not uh, like these were all 18 years above children and i mean young adults and somehow that fear was there i would just confess it that it was there on the first day and i was too nervous but after a week or so i remember this very uh, good advice by another colleague of mine at that time in the university who told me you know first of all it's okay not to know everything it's not that as a teacher we will know everything when the students ask something there's a curious uh, minds they would want to learn but just say that okay i'll come back to you with this i will learn and come back to i may not know the answer to all questions so having that humility will help your students mm-hmm. and they will learn it from you as well so and the second very good advice he gave me was shubra just make connections don't think about all the time about the course and the syllabus and the curriculum that is of course a very integral part but make human connections and those two advice or those two pieces of advice during the first week of my career as a professional you know assistant professor i think till this date it helps me a lot it mm. really helps me so that was the first part like my early experiences coming to mind mapping uh, that's again very interesting uh, because uh, though i learned mind mapping quite a, like i think it's 12 years now mm. i have been using mind mapping but i was not using it 
in my teaching and learning, I was more using it like uh, for my PhD, for my research work or for my lesson mm -hmm. planning, curriculum design, all of that I would use mind mapping, uh, even note taking. But inside the classroom, I don't know what inhibition I had, but I wasn't using it. Mm. Then it was this uh, in India, sometimes during the summer, you would feel like, you know, it's too hot. And if you have a post lunch lecture, <laughs> uh, uh, it's difficult. Yeah, we don't have this air conditioned rooms and classrooms and all. So it was like this very uh, yeah. hot day. And the moment I entered the classroom with my laptop and with all those, you know, uh, presentations and with all the problems that I'm going to give them and they'll be solving. And when I looked at their face, I was like, oh my God, I'm doing some kind of a crime. <laughs> <I'm> exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and I think listening to me is the last thing they would want to do at that time. Oh, so, yeah. At least so you I recognized like, it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they were like, uh, they were, I could see it was summer. And of course, anybody would not want to at two o'clock in a hot afternoon mm -hmm. after the lunch. And it was like kind of a mathematical subject that I was teaching. And uh, I thought, let me do something different because I cannot mm -hmm. waste the 60 minutes altogether. And I said, why not try mind mapping? But then uh, this again happened around, you know, not in the very initial phases of my career. It was almost after five years I have worked and I had gained some experience. So I knew this one thing that with children or with teenagers, you just cannot actively integrate something and tell them, okay, this is this, it has this benefits and do it. They, they mm -hmm. are going to listen that way. And it doesn't work that way. So I thought let's passively integrate. So I didn't tell them it's mind mapping or anything. I just said, okay, this is this one problem. And first, what we did was I told them, you know, whatever your name resembles, for example, uh, I'm Shubra. So if I just want to draw a central image, I will put a sun or a flower or sunflower or something. So just any a flower or some symbol you put at the center of the page that depicts your uh, name or your personality. And they were like, okay, let's do this. They did. And then I said, okay, just draw some beautiful, you know, radiant thinking kind of branches. And I was just making the templates for them. And I was asking them, what is that you love? What is that you... Uh, you know you love about yourself your strengths your weaknesses and we were talking about what is the most boring subject in your life that you just want to forget it and you know get rid of it so probably we history to, yeah kind of you know we, I was trying to um, help them understand themselves better and this entire exercise took some 15 minutes and they were all very active suddenly uh, like almost forgetting the weather outside <laughs> And then slowly okay. we did a problem solving of the actual subject that I wanted to teach them through mind mapping. Mm. And that day I realized I had something with me and I was depriving my students but not, by not teaching them that. Mm. <laughs> so again, it happened accidentally because of that hot summer afternoon and my students looking at me with a blank face that I introduced mind mapping in my classroom. And since then I started using it more frequently and I've seen... Um, you know, it gives a kind of, um, sometimes they come in groups, they do it, and it kind of gives them this um, ability to think very creatively, innovatively, deep dive within. So overall, I think uh, mind mapping has uh, helped me a lot uh, as a teacher and as well as in providing a very good learning environment to my students here. Thank you for sharing that. And I, we have concept maps or like sketch notes that we use in our class for taking notes from either the book or from class when I'm, you know, giving a lecture. And it's very similar to this mind mapping, but I love how it's like really active in the moment, like do mm -hmm. this at the center and now think of this. And I like how this is the beautiful part of teaching. There's a lot of things that go into lesson plans and you can plan and you can feel prepared and you could be super organized. And then you get in that class and they're like, no, I don't <laughs> want to do that. Like you said, and then you're like, well, I got to think on my feet right now. And it's, there's so much like spontaneity in like teaching because you're like, well, I can't do this for 60 minutes, whatever I planned, they're going to be bored out of their mind or they're just in a different place right now. So let me kind of like go to my tool belt, all of the strategies of like how I have done things, how I learn. And you're like, let's do mind mapping. And instead of going right to the content, 
you said, we're going to do something about you. And whenever you connect with the, the students, like you said, build connections, like whenever you do that, even if they're like hot or they're tired or they're, but you like do something kind of different and you don't tell them what it's called and you don't tell them like the whole behind the scenes of why we do this, but you just say, no, let's just do something different. And they just light up. And then you may have their attention for then whatever you're going to teach. So something kind of similar, not with mind mapping, but last spring I had a intro to psych minor. So I ended up doing it just first with them because it was like, I can kind of do things on the fly all the time. And then I ended up doing it for all my core classes. I went to the, uh, the uh, like storage room where we get supplies and I found these little composition books. They were, they were like those exam books you would write in like the blue books. Mm -hmm. um, but they were just like regular tan. So they kind of look like a journal, but they weren't like this big notebook. And there was a whole bunch of them sitting there. It was the end of the school year. So I'm like, well, I don't know if anyone's using them. So I just did it for one class. I took 20 of them and there was like so many piles of them. Like nobody was using it because everyone's been on the computer. <laughs> so I was like, well, maybe I could do something with this. Cause I feel like the kids need to get off the computer. Like it's been too much. And we had some really nice weather. So I made a little like mindfulness journal and I decorated it. And then I gave it out to them and I showed mine as an example. I'm like, we're going to go outside for 10 minutes and just walk around. And I want you to take in, you know, all of your sensory experience. So again, being psychology, I felt like I was still connecting it with content. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to just sit and you're going to write in this journal, anything that comes to mind, any sensory experience, what you smelled, what you heard, and we'll do that for 10 minutes. So it was just like, maybe a third of the class. It wasn't even the whole class. And they came back and they're like, I've never done anything like that before. And I felt so calm and peaceful. And what was really interesting and it's devastating, the next day, the school shooting happened in Texas. That was this past spring. And I remember I gave them those journals and we had a conversation the next day about everything going on. And like, if you want, like, you know, when you see really terrible things in the news and it's really hard to digest it, you know, and take it in and you're, you don't know what to do with it. And of course, now there's this fear again of like school and like, is it safe here and all of that? You know, you have these journals, you know, they're for you. I didn't just give it to you for a lesson and you turn it in like an assignment, like they're yours, like write in it. You know, if you're, if you're needing to like process something and get it out, like writing in a journal and not just like typing on like a document on the computer, but actually writing in the journal is very cathartic and it, it can really help with like, again, processing emotions. And they were just like, oh, wow. So like, I can use this, not just for this class. I'm like, no, it's just yours. And it was as simple as a composition book. Wow, that, that's yeah. so interesting. And uh, I, I would add to what you just said, the moment uh, the students, you know, they take a pen and as a teacher, I always keep saying this and uh, to the current generation of uh, young learners that, once in a while take up this pen and you know write and all your senses are involved and you know the mind gets a lot of clarity the moment we start writing so I, I quite agree with you on that yeah and I think that's why I like the mind mapping and doing it very actively like here's paper here's pen we're going to do this now we're going to make these connections I think it's a great way we talked about this with starting the school year like I definitely want to use this strategy is just for like an opening, you know? And I love the idea of asking them like, what don't, like, what aren't your favorite subjects? And that's why I said like, I'm sure they're gonna say history. A lot of times history gets the bad <laughs> rap and students, some students really like it, but usually they're more into like the sciences or arts or whatnot. But I like this idea of like, who are you? You know, what's your identity? You know, what are things about you? What are things that are your strengths? I think they should focus on also, like, what do you have that's like, you're really proud about, you know, and then what are the things you want to work on as a student through this year? And then what are the things that you naturally don't like as a subject? What do you love? But like, also like, what have you maybe learned in those subjects too? I do like an identity chart where they just focus on who they are and like where they come from, because then they can learn different perspectives about other students in class. But I like this as an opening and then just like really reflecting on the things that make them who they are as a person and a student. Absolutely. And it, it will give them a lot of clarity about like 
uh, you know, the, as you said, asking them what is their favorite or boring subject and also trying to take them back to their memory lanes and saying that, yes, you have so many good achievements. Like, did you help a friend or a neighbor during the vacation uh, yeah. or, or some volunteering services you did? and some accomplishments or maybe they just helped uh, their parents at home so whatever it is uh, feeding them with a lot of positive things right at the beginning of the semester they feel more confident I feel and they know okay this teacher is not there just to you know te complete her part yeah. of the duty with these lessons and then go away she is interested in my life and she cares about me and hence uh, you know so I think that's so important <laughs> yeah and that advice that you were given when you started teaching about making connections that's great advice like I'm so happy to hear you have like a mentor like that because often that's not told and it's not part of like the teaching training um which I think the the teaching training programs in colleges universities they need to be more robust and maybe they are now I've been out of school for a while mm -hmm. but they need to be more robust with that kind of how do you build relationship right like how do you build rapport with your students because you could be a a master you know you could be highest you know accomplished intellect in a field and if you just go in there and lecture and you don't ask about who they are or ask about like what they like or what they enjoy or how they connect with maybe the curriculum they're just gonna be like I don't know I mean they'll do their work maybe if they're really diligent students but they're gonna be kind of bored or they're gonna feel like this person doesn't really care about me so building that connection is so important early on and then you can kind of lead that into like all these other lessons you want to do and infusing absolutely. that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. love that. So my next part that I always talk about, and I don't know if you were teaching during the pandemic, but just about, especially when I have other people on from other countries, I think it's just great to talk about experiences during this time of the pandemic and you're in India. So what were your uh, lived experiences or if you were teaching or doing other work during the pandemic challenges aha moments takeaways things that you learned okay the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> I, I i just remember suddenly this um because uh, I, i'll be very honest here i was not someone who was very comfortable speaking on a camera like this uh, and i was always uh, with, with the students there uh, walking around the classroom uh, so somebody just sitting in the chair speaking with a camera so that was just not my cup of tea mm. until 2019 and then in 2020 when this suddenly this news came and in a week's time we were without wasting or without uh, having too much delay in the process because we also had exams coming we had to shift to this kind of classrooms through zoom or google meet or whatever the, the platform may be but more like a virtual learning so I would say the initial first few days, it was not just us, but even the students, we faced a lot of challenge. One challenge was we have a lot of students coming from different parts of the country and it's not necessary that they all have a good connectivity, internet mm. connectivity at home. Uh, so here we have that issue. That was number one. Number two, imagine a home having three children and or four children and they all have to connect. So they may not have mm. that many smartphones or you know, not enough space that, okay, each one, their voices may be actually, uh, you know, uh, at, at the same time, if they have a class. Mm -hmm. So all that kind of challenges from the student's side. So I, uh, if I look back during those days, especially during the first few months, three to four months, I believe it was more for the teachers to understand the student's perspective. We just mm -hmm. couldn't do the same thing we were doing in the class. We had to uh, understand that yes they are already in a transitioning period young children suddenly put in a room mm -hmm. and asked to uh, learn lessons through a virtual back you know this kind of virtual mode so uh, I believe it did affect them psychologically also they were like suddenly it's kind of a stress that create that was created they, they had no idea when this would be over so under all the situations I think a lot of teachers along with me we were like in this discussion that yes we need to be more considerate we need to be more that human connection more than ever it is this time that we need to tell them that it's okay if uh, they missed a class or so they could always come back to us maybe through some other mode maybe we could send them some handouts sometimes through uh, recorded videos so that they could watch it later so we made all kind of adjustments uh, based on their needs and 
so all that was going through and still i wouldn't say that we were able to give full but yes we got a lot of support towards the uh, end of 2021 by that time we were all like normal okay now we got this we mm -hmm. know how to go about it so it took first two three months but then it was more like a normal process that we thought okay this is the new normal mm -hmm. so that was about teaching but uh, during the same time i also started uh, teaching online I thought that, okay, I'm comfortable now teaching and I could actually reach to different parts of the country just by sitting at mm -hmm. home. So I also, I would say, I also took that as an opportunity to connect with more learners. And I saw there were so many people, working professionals, uh, home, you know, homemakers and uh, young like uh, students, college students across the country who wanted to learn mind mapping as a tool to gain clarity, as a tool to gain confidence in speaking, in uh, uh, expressing themselves, expressing whatever idea they have in their mind through note-taking or whatever it was. So I started to design this program where what we call as COCP. You know, I say, I, I always keep on saying that to achieve anything in life, you just need this four focus areas. Okay. Clarity, that is the base then you need to organize from notes to thoughts. You just need to organize everything. You need to have that creative element in you. So that's the next C. And then when you have this COC, that is clarity, organization, and creativity in place, productivity will come as a byproduct. Mm. So I started teaching COCP to people across the country. I think I have reached more than 1,000 people now. Wow. So I just started, I floated programs mm -hmm. initially. There were free programs and paid programs. I started mm -hmm. floating across. Wow. And I saw I was building community in mm -hmm. the pandemic, which I didn't know initially. I was connecting to people. So I would say that there was both this uh, initial challenges were there, but the pandemic taught me a lot of things. Uh, I, I call it a pilgrimage mm -hmm. period for myself. Mm, I love so that. So many realizations, so many realizations that I just cannot uh, decide certain things on my own you know uncertainty is the only answer and I got to embrace that I just got to embrace the uncertainty yeah. because there are certain things I just can't control oh. so I think it's just went on and mm. more and more people we got connected we spoke and that I focused on that one area about human connections mm -hmm. uh, no matter whatever it is the conversation must be meaningful that human connection should be there and Yes, I think that is how I sailed through or we as a community sailed through the pandemic. Yeah, that's a wonderful message and such. I love I just wrote this down. I love this mindset of clarity, organization, creativity, driving, you know, productivity. That's wonderful. And I, I think you highlighted some really great takeaways from the pandemic that I hope we hold on to moving into, we're still in a pandemic, but, you know, continuing to move out of this time period is that going through a very difficult time as a whole global collective and sharing these experiences with one another, it allows us to feel that connection. You know, like every time I talk to anyone from another country and we, and that's why I kind of asked this question as part of this podcast series is because we all can have some kind of similar you know, um, experience with that. We had children in America that didn't have, you know, connection to internet or it was really, really weak. Big families living in a home in a small space and trying to A, be connected, but then even try to learn, you know, like that is a very, I think, common challenge globally. And I think that's the one way we can connect. But then this opportunity of, well, we use Zoom now, we use Google Meet, we're, we're virtual learners now. And so I can reach more people. And what got me thinking, and I've actually had some ideas kind of sharing with other people I've been talking with, is there really could be like global academies, you know, where you could have children, maybe there's an area where there, there's a real need for teachers, but maybe they're just lacking teachers. And you can have a virtual school where kids could have teachers from all over the world and they could be teaching them not only content, but teaching them about India, right? Teaching about America, teaching about, you know, other places and their perspective. And I think yeah. there's something really valuable about that because when you talk to people from their actual home country and they're telling you about their lived experiences, instead of just hearing it in the news, 
you're getting real information. And I think it builds empathy. And I, I can see hopefully out of this pandemic, maybe where we go with having more of these virtual connections is more empathy and more sense of being this whole global collective that we're not just in our own country, right? We're not just you are here, I am there, or us versus them, you know? And I think it could be a way to like, I don't know, create, you know, more sense of community and people feeling like we're not so different, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And I I, I remember that I, I, in school, I read this poem, no man is foreign. I mean, mm. we are all a part of the single community. So such beautiful message. I was just hearing so intently to you that forming a global community and you know the children get exposure to teachers mm -hmm. from all across the world and uh, developing that sense of empathy yeah I mean mm -hmm. wonderful yeah I mean maybe one day that'll exist um, I'm thinking even just with making these mm -hmm. wonderful connections on LinkedIn because I find LinkedIn to be this beautiful community and it's all about you know connecting people all over the world that, um, and I actually talked to someone recently who's in psychotherapy and I teach psychology. I'm like, would you wanna be um, a guest speaker like on Zoom in my classroom? Cause we still have everything hooked up when we did hybrid. So we have the computer hooked up to the smart board where you could also have Zoom and we have the speakers all set up. I mean, all the technology's there. We don't need to use it for hybrid but we can use it for guest speakers that could be from all over the world. And now students can be exposed to so many different perspectives and just like we talk about perspectives we show videos we show stories mm -hmm. but actual people coming into the classroom on zoom or google meet and talking to the kids right there mm -hmm. so i don't know there's just a lot that can come this out it's going to be amazing i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is amazing i love these ideas um, my last part that I get into is any ideas that you have for the future of education or just like maybe the future of how we do more strategies like mind mapping or that can push us to kind of the next level? Oh, uh, I think I'm just learning. And while I say I'm a teacher, but before teacher, I'm a student who keeps learning every single day. That is one thing, even on my worst or the busiest day I don't stop learning I learn something new I learn add something so from my entire journey as a student as a teacher uh, I have a lot of I've been fortunate to come across a lot of good mentors in my life who show me the way whenever I'm wrong or who give me the path okay why don't you try this and give me some real challenges so out of all the experiences if I weave mm -hmm. them together I see that, yes, uh, curriculum lessons, all those are great. But as teachers, I believe uh, we have some primary uh, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I, I always keep saying this, that, you know, teachers are leaders without this title. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have a title, but then we are always, uh, you know, leading. And we by leading, I don't mean that kind of, you know, I am, I am the boss or something, but real mm -hmm. leaders who walk the path for them, sometimes, they, you know, mm -hmm even you don't know the answer but you help them find the answers so all that is mm -hmm. there so we have this responsibility one is trying to make them self-reliant mm -hmm. and I, I i read this from adlerian psychology i i love reading adlerian psychology from there i i pick up this all the time that the role of an educator is to make the students self-reliant mm. so and for that we need to help them to bring out the best in them mm -hmm. help them flourish and for that we can all we can do is give them that environment that conducive atmosphere through which they can become the best of whatever they have mm -hmm. and uh, our journey is to just help them do that that is one the other thing is that because we are also talking about the new age teaching and learning mm -hmm. i feel that uh, this is again a very personal uh, from my very personal experience that we got to teach our students how to learn not just what to learn mm. and that was the reason actually I shifted I would say after being a very core electronics engineer and then doing my PhD beating bachelor's master's and PhD I realized this one thing that having knowledge is okay but knowing how to leverage that knowledge to yes. uplift ourselves and to uplift our community that is uh, the 
the role of a teacher and we got to teach our students that uh, at least if if i don't use the word teach also i we have to share that knowledge how to leverage mm. that knowledge and that was the reason i shifted towards mind mapping because i felt this may be i know there might be a lot of tools but at least for me it has helped me so i try to tell my students not just mind mapping do radiant thing whatever you do see that you are leveraging your knowledge and helping others and yourself mm. in the process so i think yeah that that that's my experience and that's the yeah last thing that's a great message and i think we're moving into that next place in education that and we've talked about this uh, a bunch on episodes is that it can't just be like all these subjects and you're just learning a bunch of facts and content. And I think having core knowledge is important, but we do need to make sure we are giving the children space, giving the teenagers, giving young adults space to really create and grow and kind of find their way by facilitating and guiding them. I think teachers are more could be in a place of mentorship, right? Like we're mentoring you, we're advising you. We are there also as an expert, if you need to come to say me for you're working on historical research paper and you wanna look at like primary sources, right? You have those experts that are still have that background, but maybe the main role of the teacher is I'm mentoring you through whatever you're like creating and wanting to like, you know, dive into. So I feel like in schools, there should be more choice with what students really want to like dive into and learn. You can have again, core knowledge. And I was just saying this yesterday to someone, I mean, I'm not taking anything away, away from math because you know, that's, that's definitely your subject area. It was not for me, but the math that I learned in high school, maybe after like ninth grade, never really used it. Like I don't use it for anything. And what if you took away some subjects that you're really like, I'm not really going to use it. I'm not really passionate about it. And then you built in more time for those students to work on something they really care about, or maybe even working on like a project where it gives back to the community, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We could do some service learning. We could actually take them to some, uh, you know, f uh, I call it field study, just take them there. Yeah experiential learning you know it's all about experience experiential mm -hmm. learning it's not just that one thing you hold and then the deliver and your work is over yeah. <laughs> so it's not going to be that way anymore yeah and you want to keep them engaged you know if students are taking a bunch of classes because they're told to take it mm -hmm. and I feel like that's very old school way of thinking like you yes. have to do this why you just have to do it you know like this generation doesn't really like that answer they're like no, I need to know why. And I need the, I need it to be meaningful. So I think they're ready. Like the students I've seen, at least in my school and in my experience here in America, is that they're ready for that next level of, can you give us some space to like create? Can you give us choices? Can you allow me to dive into my passion projects? Can I do something that's more, you know, getting out in the community um, and not have this like, transcript of everything I have to take. So I see that being transformative. I have hope that the more conversations educators have, and almost every educator I talk to is on the same page, that maybe that will be infused into the school system and will change over time. It's not going to happen in, you know, a year or two, but maybe over time, because I think that's the next kind of level. Absolutely, absolutely. And it sounds so interesting. And as, as I say that we are all here, the teachers towards um, making the process of teaching learning, not just inclusive, but as I said, making them self-reliant and taking yes. them to the next level where we give them space and, you know, whatever you have said that the students, I think right now, even they are ready for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe more and more schools and colleges across the world. Yeah, we'll pick up this message. And yeah, I look forward to such a day. Jacqueline. I know you too. And it's all about innovation, right? I mean, we look at even like your country, India and America, like there's so much innovation that's come out of our countries, but we could have so much more if we gave that to the students, like, and going back to, you know, accessibility and having, you know, real equity too is giving all kids that opportunity because some kids do have that. There's some schools that already are like doing a lot of that project-based learning 
And there's some schools that are just really doing the old school way. And that's not really equitable, you know? So all students should have the ability to really grow and feel like they're doing something they wanna do and that they could then be the next innovators, you know, in society. So I love this conversation. This is wonderful. Thank you. I loved it too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much for being on the teacher story. I've really enjoyed our conversations and I and look forward to having, con you know, continuing conversations with you. Wow. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. And it was an absolute honor and to be on the show in the first place. And I just love the entire conversation. I learned a lot during this conversation. So thank you for that. Yes. Thank you. And I just feel like we've like made this really great connection and we're on the same page about how students should learn and you're doing such great work. So thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye. Bye. -bye.